Hey folks, back again for the sixth and final installment of myself talking to Tom Gaylord, the godfather of air guns. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how Tom and I got started in air guns respectively and where we've seen the industry go in that time and where we think it's going in the future. Kind of doing some reminiscing with one another about air guns gone by in the past. Uh, reminiscing about the nice weather we had down in Texas since we're starting to get nice weather up in Cleveland here again and just thinking about how great it was to get to sit down and talk to Tom. I hope you guys have enjoyed the series. Uh, again, this is the last one, so hopefully you enjoy it. Let us know in the comments if you did. Maybe we'll do something similar in the future. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We appreciate it a ton. We'll see you at the end. For the folks that don't know, yeah, when did you get into the air gun game. Cool, good question. 1976. Holy cow. Now, I had air guns as a kid, like most American boys do. Uh, I had some Benjamins, I had some Daisies. So I'm not including that. But in 1976, I was in Germany serving with the Army, and I bought a Diana Model 10 recoilless target pistol, and that started me shooting target air pistol, and I actually had, I, I was a nationally ranked air pistol shooter for a while, a very brief while. Tough thing to stay on top of. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I didn't. <laughs> um, so I've been around since then, but I really got into it when I started the air gun letter in 1994. And then when I started my blog in 2005, um, I, I'm in it every day. I write a blog every day. So probably starting in 94 and progressing and then suddenly boom in 2005, that's what I've seen. And what I've seen is we've gone from, <laughs> I remember when the first modern PCP was introduced. It was a day state and day state took one of these capture guns that shoots darts into yep. animals, and they said, what if we put a 22 caliber barrel on it? And they came out with a gun they called the Day State Huntsman. Now, I never had one of those, but I had the next generation mm -hmm. of those. And it was a fairly straightforward gun, cost $600 in the 90s, which would be a lot more today. Yeah, sure. But it was very accurate, very interesting. But all... PCPs were expensive in those days. Um, I shot field target in the late 90s. I started with, well, I actually started with PCPs. I started with a day state, what was it? Huntsman Mark II? Sure. I think. I got from Rodney Boyce, brand new, nice gun. And then Gary Barnes made me a custom rifle that I mm. competed with. But then I got a TX-200 and I started shooting Springer. And I was the guy, Tyler, who held the bell curve down on the low end so that people could win. <laughs> I was, in, in a 60-shot match, I was the guy shooting 45s. It's and, not bad. You know, well, on my best day. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't a good shot. Yeah. I was an okay shot. Air pistol, I'm a little bit better at. But anyhow, sure. that's what I've seen. And then the 90s, uh, I remember when Pyramid Air started. All right, so hang on. Let's back up a second, though. All right, back up. Let's talk about when spring piston guns became real in terms of power. Because oh, this is yeah, something yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are a lot of people out there that don't know the backstory, I suppose, of really where the first kind of what by today's standards is not the most powerful thing, yeah. but where like a Magnum spring piston gun started. Okay, yeah, I, I've written a lot about this. Yes. Uh, it was in the early 1970s, and there were a couple of companies that were vying for, and in those days, the magic mark was to go faster than 800 feet per second. And you had Diana in the United States, imported by RWS, you had um, BSF, who went out of business in the early 1980s, uh, and you had um, Weirauch. Weirauch had the HW35 that they still make, yep. uh, it, and it 
if it made 800, that was the best it ever did. It, it just couldn't quite make it. And the reason was the, the piston stroke was too short, but the, the Diana 45 had a nice long piston stroke and it went over 800. Uh, the BSF, the S55, the S60, the S70, and I think they went up to the S90. Those all went over uh, 800 if they were taken care of. And then along comes this company out of Germany called FWB, Feinwerkbau. And up until that point, they'd made target guns. Yep. And nobody feared Feinwerkbau. Well, they made a Model 121, and it was cool. And they made it in 177 because they like 177s. And it shot in the high sevens. And they said, what if? And they tweaked it. And they came out with the FWB 124. And that thing went over 800, no problem. And that was when it happened. That started what I call the horsepower wars, yep. which are really the velocity wars. Yep. 800 wasn't enough anymore because quite a few companies could do it. So along comes Dr. Beeman with his Beeman R1, which was also the HW80, and that produced 940 feet per second. And that was pretty good. And then the next year, he super tuned it, and it was doing 1,000 feet per second. And then he laserized it, and it was doing 1,100 feet per second. And then I think it was 1986, out comes Diana with these side levers, yep. and they're doing 1,100 feet per second right out of the box. And then came Gamo. <laughs> and Gamo said, that is not fast enough for mm. us. And they started pushing the velocity. Well, they advertise them at 1,600. The fastest I ever saw was 1,475. Yeah. But it doesn't really matter. Once the horsepower or velocity wars started, they didn't stop. Yep. Still haven't. No, no. Now the big deal is to get larger caliber pellets yes. going that fast. Yes. You know. And PCPs have changed that a lot. Oh, yes, have so. they yeah. ever? Yeah. Yeah. As the market started to transition into the PCP game. Yep. You know, so I'm, I'm trying to get you up into my time, which is like late 2000s. So you know, Air Arms, Daystate, and a handful of other small British manufacturers really started PCPs from the ground up in the early 90s. They did. Um, and a lot of those guns, the crazy part, like I have an NJR 100. There right? you go. It was made in 94. Yeah. I have a Ripley AR5S, which has 1991 scratched into the side of it, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, these are like heirloom, but they're also by today's standards, like top tier still mm -hmm. PCPs. Um, where did that really start to catch on? I was at the SHOT Show, and I met a guy by the name of John McCaslin. <laughs> and he had this gun. Oh, John, you're not going to like this. It was called the Gunpower Stealth. And he was building it for the UK market. And he had his UK salesman there, really was the importer in the UK. And come to find out, these two guys were buddies. And the guy from the UK had brought a gun over and showed it to John a couple years before and said, isn't this cool? Well, it wasn't cool at all, it was horrible. And John said, I could build a better gun than that. And the guy said, I'd like to see you try. So John went home and he did, he built a better gun than that. And the guy said, I could sell these. And he did, Gunpower Stealth. Well, I was at the show, I said, I want one of those Gunpower Stealths. Well, they're only 12 foot pounds because the UK has a 12 foot pound energy limit on their air guns, but without a license. You can get a license, you can go higher. John said, you really want just 12 foot pounds? I said, well, no, I want more, but that's what you got, I'll buy one. How do I buy it? Do I have to write to this guy in the UK? And that actually threw John for a loop. He hadn't thought that far ahead. <laughs> well, within a couple of years, he came out with the Talon. And the Talon 
had a power adjuster on the side because Americans like power yep. and he didn't have to worry about 12 foot pounds anymore. And then he came out with the Talon SS and now we're up to your era. We're up to about 2001. So, and, and at that point, it's really, you have Air Force in the PCP game. You have the Europeans, which are the high end, right? Absolutely. Uh, you have probably FX starting to OEM guns for Logan or vice versa or however that situation yeah, worked. Right. Um, I don't know it either. Yeah, so you got like Air Arms, you got Day State, a handful of others, um, and then you have Air Force and the Koreans. Yeah. Right, which were, were a thing, you know, you have. You know, that's right. I didn't even mention the Koreans, sure. but they were there, yeah. Yeah, and also building very powerful guns, some innovations in terms of repeaters. And, and of course, we, we can't forget the 10 meter companies, Walther, Onshoots, Fine Work, Bow. They're oh, no. all doing PCPs at this point, but all relegated for the most part, with the exception of one or two, to, you know, your five, six foot pound Olympic right. guns. Target, yeah. yeah. So, as the 2000s kind of progressed, right, you know, we talked about this with, you know, Crossman and Benjamin coming out with the discovery and, and obviously how, for lack of better phrasing, game changing that ended up being along with the Marauder. What did that cause? Because the ripples of, of what happened, what Crossman and Benjamin did with those guns, we're still kind of feeling today and we're still living off of today. I mean, yeah. people don't realize the, the Marauder's been on the market for thir Since, 12 or 13 years yeah. and, and has, for the record, Still sells well. <laughs> been an incredible seller through that time, even as they've evolved it. As and, it deserves to. Sure. It's a good gun. Sure. Yeah. You know. Well, and under the, under the uh, table, Crossman is starting to rifle their own barrels. They're learning how to rifle barrels. They're doing a great job. Suddenly they don't have to buy aftermarket barrels. That makes it less expensive for them to produce. That's a good thing too. Sure. So there's a, there's a lot that's going on. Everybody points their finger and says, "Oh, it hasn't changed." Yeah. Well, it has changed. True. But not in ways people can see. Yeah. And and sometimes, like the Armada, you can see it. Um, what has it done? It's woken up the air gun world. Just prior to political situations turning bad, firearms becoming difficult, well, not difficult to acquire. Ammo getting Everybody difficult to was acquire. buying firearms yeah. because they thought they weren't gonna be able to, yeah. and that, remember like the toilet paper shortage? Well, we had a firearm shortage, yeah. and the prices went up, yeah. and your $900 AR was now a $2,500 AR. Well, air guns, they're good. We didn't know that. And now they're really, really good. And then along comes FX and RAW and Daystate with all these wompty doodle, really powerful, accurate guns at 100 yards and beyond. We ain't going back. No, no, we're not. We when, when I started in this business, and I'll say I started in 1994 with my air gun letter, newsletter, I estimated, because nobody knew, that there were 15,000 active air gunners in the United States. <laughs> there were probably millions of people who owned air guns, yeah. but they were in a closet right. someplace. Today, hundreds of thousands. We have broken through that, that glass ceiling. Why? Because firearm guys have come over to air guns. They've seen that they are so capable and you don't have to give up your firearms. Right. You can still have your AR, but it's a lot cheaper to shoot that accurate PCP when you can get the pellets yep. than, than that 5.56 AR when you can get the ammunition or afford it. So that's what's happened. That Marauder and that Discovery, they, they busted us right through the glass ceiling at the very time when firearms were gonna, and ammo, were gonna get hard to come by. Sure. It, it didn't happen the same year. Obviously, it happened over a period of time, but the period of time was kind of condensed. Yeah. Yeah, it happened very quickly. It's still kind of happening. Yeah, I mean, it's still kind of happening. You know, as we see some of those crazy high-end features get trickled into, yep. you know, a lot of those lower-priced offerings. What, el what else has changed? Because, like, for me, I think it was 2016, 2017, compressors just oh, 
changed everything Didn't again. It? And there were, you know, some, I've been asked before, what were the biggest changes since like I've been with Pyramid Air, right? I was transitioning from our sales team to, into like kind of my current role um, on the product side and the Air Venturi compressor comes out, the big one. Yep. And the Air Force Texan come out. Those single-handedly changed the landscape of our sales dramatically because all of a sudden you had a big bore gun that was like really powerful. Well, you know, four or 500 foot pounds at the time in the 45, 457, uh, it was a monster. You know, nobody was even close to it. You know, uh, no, sorry, uh, Umarex had, had announced the hammer, but you know, we hadn't right. seen it yet. Right. Um, well, you and I had seen kind of it, uh, what it, 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 where it started anyway. Sure. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, but Air Force beat everybody to the punch with something that was like really powerful and made it available to everybody. And you needed air. Yes. And there was the compressor. And prior to that, those compressors that could fill a big tank were three grand. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have one for sub 1500 bucks. Yeah. And it does it in under an hour, right? I like know. it was, it was pretty quick. And um, those two things, at least in my time, and then obviously the subsequent other compressors that have come out oh, and yeah. your, your personal compressor units, like the Nomad, the Travelers, yeah. you know, all that stuff, um, have, have further changed the game. Yes. You know, and those, like for me, those are probably the big ones. And then obviously seeing all the adjustability. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, when I first got into air guns, having a regulated PCP meant you had something that was worth, yeah. worth uh, some money. Yeah. And that was all well and good. But you didn't know what you were doing with it. You shot the gun as it came. There were no adjustments. None. You weren't playing with hammer springs. You weren't like messing with regulators and, and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, you have companies like Air Arms, like FX that start putting power adjustments onto guns, um, you know, and obviously like Day State's got their electronics and stuff, right. which you can adjust things as well. And then you start to see that stuff trickle down. And now we have adjustable regulators that you can mess with while there's air in the gun, know. you know, uh, it's, it's really wow, you know, just yeah. crazy, crazy, crazy. Well. Let's not overlook ammunition. Sure. Dr. Beeman told me that H&N had told him that they were down to such accuracy when they were making pellets that to go any better, they'd have to make them uh, more accurate at the uh, molecular level. <laughs> well, that wasn't going to happen. But somehow, JSB redesigned a pellet that turns around and now the raw and probably other guns i i know the raw because plenty I'm of others it. yep cowabunga so ammunition has changed the slug game the slug is really game. coming up oh yeah yeah oh, and everybody wants to shoot slugs yeah why because well, they're heavier they buck the wind better are they as accurate? Not yet. It depends. If you, if you got the right barrel for them, <laughs> there are a handful of guns out there that shoot and them incredibly well. Lead-free pellets. I can remember when lead-free pellets was a joke. Yeah, you couldn't shoot them worth a darn. They you couldn't hit the... No. And now they make target pellets. Uh, what's the light? Um, well, you got H&N's Green Line. You one. have Predator GTOs. Yes. Both of them are... Yeah. Uh, in a lot of cases, just as accurate as their, you know, lead counterparts in many guns. I always test them in my yep. target guns, and sometimes they come out on top. Yeah, yeah. Now, the problem with them is they're usually made out of tin, and right. tin costs like four or five times as much as lead, so they're very expensive yeah. for 500 pellets. Uh, don't know a way around that. Maybe maybe you guys can figure out how to make uh, yeah. paper mache pellets. <laughs> ah, somebody will figure something out. I'm or sure. Or make a pellet that you don't that you can reuse over and over and over again, but the barrel has to be changed on every shot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the right answer, Tom. <laughs> well, look, you know, for me, I just think that there's been especially in the last like five or 10 years, yeah. just an incredible amount of 
growth and also diversity of a lot of companies coming into the game. I mean, you know, who would ever thought that we'd see a, like a manufacturer like a SIG, um, you know, actually get into air guns yeah. and, and do it or attempt to do it right, you know, and actually dive in and, and build stuff in house and, and produce innovative guns. It just wasn't really a thing. It was always an afterthought, you know, for a lot of these companies. It was like, here, it, take my name and, and you experienced air gun manufacturer over here, make my air guns, right? right. Um, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, obviously, with like the replica game, that, you know, Umarex is the king of the replica and they've done an incredible job doing that for so many firearms companies yeah. and Crossman does it. I mean, there's a bunch of different ones out there. Um, but just to see the, the breath. You've lived through it. Yeah. You came in right well, at the beginning of all of this you explosion. Too. Yeah. Well, I have, but I also saw it before. I right. was in the sleepy days before it exploded. Right. You came in right as it was starting yep. to explode. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just curious to see where we're going. Because, you know, it's hard to see sometimes when you're yeah. in it, yeah. you know. You're working on what you're working on and, you know, you kind of get some insight. Like you and I get, get some heads up on things that are being talked about. And, and what I'm saying, Tyler, and, and folks who are watching is we ain't done yet. Hmm. Stuff is still happening right now. Oh, I got one for you real soon, actually. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not what you're thinking either. Thanks for joining us on this six part series where we talked to Tom Gaylord about all things air guns. Hopefully you guys enjoyed a look back into Tom and I's air gunning past. Uh, if you did, let us know down below in the comments if there was anything that stuck out to you through the series. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Maybe we'll do it again sometime soon. For now though, I have to get back to work because uh, well, got to work for a living. I don't get to write about air guns all day like Tom does. So thanks again to Tom. Thank you very much to our friends at Air Force for helping us get this done, giving us the space to do it. To John McCaslin, Yvette Hicks, Cameron Brinkerhoff, we appreciate it a ton. Uh, couldn't have done it without you guys. And speaking of ton, Ton Jones, you too, you're the man. Tom, thank you again for your time, man. I really appreciate it, brother. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. Later.